A few years ago, Jill and I were invited to go to China to engage in ministry there in a variety of different situations. Now, those of you who are familiar with the church in China, you'll know the phenomenal growth that has been experienced in the Chinese church during the recent decades. And much of this growth has taken place in small groups, in small villages scattered over this huge country. Now, as we all know, China and India are the most populous nations in the whole world. And so when we think in terms of villages and small groups in China, we've also got to think in terms of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people. We were invited on this particular occasion to meet with the leaders of some of the small house churches that were gathering in China at that particular time. And they had a particular reason for inviting us to meet with them. And the reason was this, they had heard something that they found very, very difficult to understand. They had heard that when I was 70 years of age, I had voluntarily stepped down as the senior pastor of the church that I'd pastored for 30 years. They couldn't understand that. Why would somebody who is only 70 years of age in good health, why in the world would he ever voluntarily surrender the privilege and responsibility of the ministry? And then they told me, we have leaders in their 80s. We have leaders in their 90s. Well, we respect them. We recognize that they are very, very experienced. They have a long history. We recognize that they are the people who have built the church. Why? Why would they ever step down? And we would never even think to suggest that they should. Well, that was rather different from what we experience in the West. The situation they were in was that the particular leader of the group that we were meeting with was actually still in prison. He was, I think, about 90 years of age. He'd been in ill health for a long time, but even so, from prison, he was still in charge of the whole thing. I asked them, how many people would attend services in the small groups that you have oversight for? How many people would be there? And they said, oh, about one million people. One million people were in the scattered small groups that they were overseeing. And the whole ministry was being overseen by a 90-year-old man who was in prison. How does that fit with the way we think in the Western church? Well, <laughs> it's very obvious that it is the exact opposite of the way that we would go about things here. You see, the thing is, in the East, they revere old age. In the West, I wouldn't say as we tend to revere old age, particularly in the church situation in the church in America is that whilst we do acknowledge that the Bible talks about the leadership of the church as being elders, we don't really think of it as being older people. What we really think about is we've got to have youthful enthusiasm, we've got to have youthful energy, we've got to have fresh thinking, etc., etc. We may point out, yes, but older people have a sense of history and they have a sense of tradition. But in the Western church, we say, and who wants to repeat history? And who wants to get bogged down with tradition? We've got to be forward looking. We've got to be forward moving. Well, the Bible does say that the leaders of the church should be elders. The word translated elder is also translated older people. So I think we should, first of all, learn from the church in China 
that has grown exponentially in a way that we haven't seen in the Western world for a long, long time, if ever at all. We should learn from them. But at the same time, we should treasure the things that we have learned in the Western culture. What we're actually talking about is what is the role of seniors in the church in America today? Where do seniors fit? I think from my experience, I would have to say that they don't fit very well in many parts of the contemporary church. I remember on occasion we were in a conference for seniors in America and we listened to many of them. Now, th these were, were people who had uh, retired from responsible positions. They had a long history in their churches. They were devout believers and they were committed to their local church. But there were two things that we heard repeatedly from these people. The first thing that we heard from them was really sad. They said, in the church, we feel marginalized. And in the culture, we feel traumatized. In the church, we feel marginalized. In the culture, we feel traumatized. I first personally believe that those are two things that should never ever be the case in the church of Jesus Christ. What is the role of older people in the church, or for that matter, in any part of the culture? Well, I think we've got to understand the unique things that we know about seniors. I happen to believe that seniors are a unique resource that the church does not always appreciate or utilize. Let me explain what I mean by this unique resource. Seniors have the most life experience. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. If they're seniors, it's because they have lived longer than juniors. So when we think in terms of older people, we've got to accept the fact that they have lived longer, they have experienced more, they have gone through life in a variety of modes, in a variety of situations, and presumably they have learned some lessons from all the life experiences that they have gone through. Now, when we think in terms of learning from experience, what we're actually talking about is garnering or gathering wisdom. Wisdom, what is that? Well, wisdom is not information. Wisdom is knowing what to do with the information we have gained. There's no shortage of information. If you look at, we live in the information age, we're often being told that. But when we look at the chaos that is the result of this information age in so many parts of our culture, we have to say, how is it that we know so much and yet we make so many mistakes. And the answer very often is this, we have not known how practically to apply the information that we have. Now, older people have gone through more situations. The more situations they have gone through, the more opportunities they've had to apply the information that they have garnered over the years. Therefore, there's a pretty good possibility that they may have gained wisdom. Now think of the older people in the church of which you're a part. Think of the accumulated wisdom of their years and think of what a resource it could be. You know, when we think of people living a long time, going through a lot of experiences, gaining a lot of wisdom, we probably think to ourselves, I, I, I rather like the idea of learning from them because it's just possible that I could learn from their mistakes rather than learning from my own. Well, just put that in the back of your head for a minute. All the seniors in the church think of their accumulated life experience, the application of 
what they've been learning over the years and the net result of wisdom. The second thing about seniors is that they do have the most discretionary income. That's where much of the wealth of our society resides. It's in the pockets, it's in the bank accounts of the older people. Now, when we think in terms of ministry, when we think in terms of the things that we want to accomplish in the Church of Jesus Christ today, if we're smart, we do know that most of the things that we would like to see happen, uh, happen because of investment of funds. Now, I'm not saying that God needs our money. I don't think he does. But the reality is, if we're going to translate what God is telling us to do, that are part of his purposes, then we've got to recognize that money is necessary. Where's it going to come from? Well, in actual fact, it is in all probability most likely to come from the bank account, from the pockets, from the wallets of the senior people. The third thing to bear in mind is this. They have the most wisdom. They have the most discretionary income. They also have the most free time, particularly if they are retired. Now, much of the work of the church is done by volunteers. But more than thinking in terms of getting the work done in the church by volunteers, what we need to realize is this, that the ministry of the church is not in the hands of a select ordained few. The select ordained few have the responsibility and the privilege of training and equipping the people who constitute the body of believers, training them to do the work of ministry. Now then, it's <laughs> I often heard people when I was a senior pastor say, Stuart, we are so busy. Our day jobs are so demanding. Our travel time is so demanding. We get home. We've got our families to look after. And then we want to come and be involved in the church times of worship and teaching. And then on top of that, you want us to run small groups. And on top of that, you want us to get out and exercise ministry. We don't have time. Well, senior people do have the free time. So why don't we utilize them? And the next thing, of course, is that they, and this ties in with the idea of life experience and wisdom, but they do have a sense of history and tradition. Now, somebody has said that if we don't learn our history, we are doomed to repeat it. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Very, very often, we engage in activities in the church because somebody has a good idea. But we could save ourselves a lot of trouble if before we embark on what this new idea is all about, we take the trouble to think in terms of what led up to this idea, what led up to this situation, what led up to this opportunity, and think about how to handle it in its proper context. Let me give you an example. G.K. Chesterton, who had much, much advice in many, many wonderful aphorisms, said this, never dismantle a fence until you have ascertained why it was erected in the first place. Just imagine all the problems that we wouldn't have experienced if before dismantling something, we had taken the trouble to find out why it was erected in the first place. That's what history will do for you. And of course, in, along with history, there's tradition. Now, young people say, oh, don't give me tradition. Don't tell me we know we've got to do what we've always done because we've always done it as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. That's just for old folks. We're forward looking. The future is ahead of us. That's where we need to be focusing. That's where we need to go. Well, I've been around long enough to know this, that to understand the future, it's very, very helpful to know where you are at the present. And it's even better if you know how you got to where you are in the present, because you can project 
not from where you are, but you can protect from where you were. And it is tradition and the accumulation of all that you have learned that is going to spend that is going to serve you well. That's why these seniors are so much helpful, have so much help to offer us. But then the next thing is this. Seniors know the church of which you are a part better than you do. They are the ones who have they've invested in it well. They are the ones who understand it well. They are the ones who have a deep, deep heart for that church that they have manifested over the years. Now, what am I saying? Am I saying, all right, young people, take a back seat, sit there and be quiet and just learn from your elders? Absolutely not. What I am saying is we need to respect the fact that seniors have much to offer the local church at this time and we do well to think about it so learn from the hist from the experience of the church in china and let's be willing to look realistically at the realities of the resources to be found in our seniors now not all churches are the same obviously and not all churches have the similar have the same attitude to the seniors in their midst. So let me give you three possible scenarios. Scenario number one. It's a beautiful old church. It, it has a long, long history. But when you look at it, it looks as if it could enjoy a coat of paint. When you look uh, around the facility, it, it's uh, it, it's a little crummy. It's kind of past its best. And when you gather with the congregation for their worship, you realize that there's a lot of white hair and there's a lot of gray hair. And there's a lot of hair that has been dyed so that the white and the gray don't show. In other words, it is an aging congregation. Now, it may well be uh, that this group of people who make up this congregation have grown old together. There are long, long friendships. There are deep, deep associations. Many of them will be related to each other. They are perfectly content with the way that the church is going because they have no vision for anything other than being well cared for and making sure that they are being spiritually nurtured and overseen and that things are progressing the way they like them to go. But there is one reality and they don't like to think about it, they don't like to talk about it, <clears throat> but they really need to face it and it is this. That church is slowly dying. That church is slowly dying. Now here's another scenario. This is a church that has a group of seniors in the church, but it is a thriving church. It has a lot of young families. It has quite a few middle-aged people in it and lots and lots of kids and quite a number of teenagers and 20-somethings. And this is a church with a future. It is very much interested in reaching the youth population and so they are increasingly youth orientated. Well, this sounds like a good situation. There's one, one problem with this situation. Whilst at the youth end, there is great vitality, there's great enthusiasm, there is reproduction, there is growth. As far as the seniors are concerned, many of them are tolerating the many, many things that are dealing with the desires of the youth, but which are very, very foreign to the older people. They're sitting there, they're gritting their teeth, they're coming to worship, but finding rather than worshiping, they're being irritated by what is going on. And many of them have decided they'll just quietly steal away. The reality is that many of our churches that are thriving youthfully 
are actually dying as far as the older generation is concerned. Now, many younger people would simply say, well, that's too bad, they've had their day, they had it the way they wanted it, and now we are thinking in terms of the next generation. I think we should be thinking about the next generation. I don't think we should be forgetting the present generation, however. And there we have a situation. Two different churches, one made up of older congregations that have got everything the way they like it, but it's slowly dying. Others that have got a very strong youth orientation. They're seniors who built the church and who financed the church and who brought it to its special, a particular place of significance. But now they're tolerating the trends and are beginning to leave in numbers. Two very different churches. Here's the third scenario. Churches, there are churches that take seriously one of the things that the Apostle Paul said. What the Apostle Paul said was this, that in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor slave owner, there's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now that is a remarkable statement. It's a remarkable statement, not least for the fact that uh, there was a traditional Jewish prayer, and remember Paul was Jewish, and, and remember that most of the people who formed the early church were Jewish. They had a, a very serious prayer where they thanked God that they were a Jew and not a Gentile, that they were a male and not a female, that they were free and not a slave. And Paul took that ancient Jewish prayer turned it on its head and said, in Christ, Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, those are not the issues. We are all one in Christ Jesus. What he was actually saying is this, that the one, the, one of the unique characteristics of the Church of Jesus Christ is that it is a community of people who are widely diverse but whilst they are widely diverse, they are united in Christ. In other words, the Apostle Paul was preaching and teaching something that we will call unity in diversity and diversity that, that honors unity. When you think about it, that is what sets the Church of Jesus Christ apart from many other organizations in our cultures. <laughs> I remember when uh, I played rugby, I thought one day, would, wouldn't it be interesting to try to get these people who were united as a rugby team with the love of rugby, wouldn't it be fun to teach them embroidery? <laughs> how, how much chance would you have of getting rugby players to be interested in embroidery? Well, I would say, your chances would be slim to nil, and that's over-exaggerating the possibilities. What you've got to realize is this, that people are often united because they have very, very specific and narrow interests. The church, the church is made up of Jew and Greek. The church is made up of male and female. The church is made up, if you like, of slave and free. In other words, the Church of Jesus Christ is a community that transcends all the things that divide our culture. And the uniqueness of the Christian Church is that we are able to build bonds of love and of sharing and of fellowship that transcend all the things that normally divide us. And one of the things that divides the Church and in fact is dividing our culture seriously at the present time, is what I would call generationalism. We spend an awful lot of time talking about the boomers and the generation Xers and the millennials and the ones who are following the millennials. I can't just think what we call them right now. And we, when we talk about the boomers as opposed to the generation X, as opposed to the millennials, what we talk about is the differences between them. And we focus on the differences and we cater to the differences. 
and overlook the fact that the things that boomers and Generation Xers and millennials have in common far outweigh the, the, difference, the differences that they all experience. The church, I believe, should be a community of believers that has a place for the boomers and has a place for the Generation Xs and has a place for the millennials and has a place for the young adolescents and teenagers where they demonstrate being all one in Christ Jesus. That means that the seniors fit it means that they fit with the people who are juniors. It means that a person in his 70s could actually have close relationship with people in their 20s, could be a resource for them, and at the same time, the 20s could bring life and spark and understanding of the contemporary culture to the old timer. You say, why does this matter? What, what, what's, what's so important about this? Well, I'll give you one reason. I believe this principle of unity in diversity is a reflection of what God is and what God does and what God makes. You see, we believe in the Trinity. Now, I know the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but what we do know is this, that God is present in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are separate, but they are one. They are three in one. They are one in three. They are unity in diversity. They are diversity in unity. Now then, when you look at what God has made, you will find that there is a unity in what He has made, but this unity allows for bewildering diversity. I was trying to explain this to a group of missionaries in Japan on one occasion. They'd taken us to a beautiful resort area uh, for our conference and then kept us in meetings all day. And one afternoon I was speaking, it was a beautiful day in a beautiful resort up in the mountains and the forests and the lakes of Hokkaido, Japan and nobody was interested in what I was talking about. <laughs> so I decided that I, I wouldn't talk for a little while and see if anybody noticed. So I just stopped talking and nobody noticed for a little while. And then they did turn around and say, is, is everything okay? And I said, yes, I just didn't want to disturb you because you were all looking outside. And so I started looking outside and I realized how beautiful it is outside. So. I tell you what we'll do, we'll take a little break and go outside. When we go outside, we're going to look at the beautiful scenery and we're going to think about something. We're going to think about the fact that God created green on one occasion. And this is what I want you to do. I want you all to go outside. I want you to look over the forest and I want you to just enjoy the greenery but then ask yourself a question. How many shades of green can I see? Go on, off you go. Well, they didn't want to go when I gave them position to go, but I prevailed upon them. They came back about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes later. So I said, all right, did you see the green? Yeah. What did you notice about green? Well, it's very green. <laughs> that was about it. Okay. How many different shades of green did you see? Well, they said we lost count. We'd never realized it before. We'd never, we'd no idea. I said, how many of the greens were non-green? None of them. How many were hyper green? How many were super green? How many were winter green? How many were lime green? We just went down the list and we realized something. That when you talk about green, there's a unity of greenness. But there is a bewildering diversity of greenness as well. And all these different greennesses are equally green, but none of them are the same as the other. And that shouldn't surprise us because it's the work of the Trinity. Now, the church is the work of our triune God. And I believe that one of the things we should be working towards is this. 
We need to be working for ways in which we find we transcend the generations and we build bridges where there are barriers. And we begin to show a watching world that fractures and fragments over all kinds of issues, not least over generationalism and ageism and sexism. And we should begin to show the people that it's possible in Christ for people who are normally divided to be united in love and mutual support. That's the church in action. So let me conclude by leaving a challenge to seniors and a challenge to those who aren't seniors, but will be one day. So here's a call and a challenge to the church. Church, recognize the resources that you have in the seniors in your midst. Seize them as valued members of the body of Christ and show them that you recognize their value. Evaluate your existing seniors ministry, if any, and enter into an intentional approach to focusing on the particular needs and interests of the, of the seniors in your midst and encourage them to recognize that they have a boundless opportunity to invest the remaining years of their lives with the unique resources that they have. Teach them this, encourage them this, to do this and above all give them the opportunity and the encouragement and all of the help that they need to live wisely and well in these final days of their lives on earth church we should do this here's a call and a challenge to the seniors in our midst don't say we've done our bit you're not finished yet you're still with us. Recognize the unique position that a senior holds in our society as a whole and address the shortcomings of the Western approach to age. Show yourself to be indispensable. Look for ways of improving with age in the life of your church. And remember, if seniors are the fastest growing demographic group in the USA, then possibly seniors are the largest unreached people group in the USA, in which case they need to be reached and the church needs to be intentionally mobilized to reach them. And who is most likely to do this? And it's a no-brainer. It's the seniors themselves. So God bless you and go for it.